Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters and colleagues, I uh, would like to introduce a special topic for everyone today. Uh, this is uh, sometimes is common topic, other time it is not that much familiar to all the Muslims here in America. So there is a growing trend of uh, individuals who are incarcerated or in prison they are finding islam while they are serving their time so as as an individual like me i'm abul rashid i also experienced giving dawah in prison and i met many of the individuals like that in prison who accepted islam in prison and we have our panel member i will let them introduce as well but we would like to talk about when these brothers who get released from this uh, from the prisons how as a muslim individual as a muslim business owners as a muslim community in general we can help them we can help them to acquire skills we can help them to find a job we can and help them to find a family especially as a muslim we are all one family one ummah so we want to make sure these brothers when they get out they don't feel isolated they don't feel depressed they don't have to do anything which might take them back into prison again so that is our topic how can we help release prisoners uh with uh good background hopefully inshallah train them help them to establish in our society so that is our topic would like to introduce uh two uh panelists with us i would go with mr shajad gafur and then with sheikh saeed parcel so mr shajad gafur please go ahead introduce yourself for our audience uh thank you dr rashid uh for having us uh, and uh to the brothers um, you know, this it's uh, exciting uh, to be to be beginning the next chapter of your life. Uh, the job market is 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 great. Uh, if you're looking for work, we're all short staffed. Help wanted signs are everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, talk to family and friends. Uh, you know, talk to previous employers. Uh, you know, where you worked before, and. Uh, you know, as we'll talk more about this, I can share a little bit about myself, uh, my own struggles. Um, uh, currently, I'm in, uh, well, I've been in the motel business, have several retail businesses, uh, a few restaurants, uh, also a developer builder, building homes and apartments. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. And uh, we'll talk more, see, you know, how we could add value to each other. Uh, else? Great, thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to learn from employment and business owner perspective what uh, you know you have uh, for us, inshallah. Now we move to uh, Sheikh Said Purcell, who has extensive experience in Dawa in prison. So uh, please go ahead, Sheikh, uh, introduce yourself and give your background. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam ala ashraf al anbiya wa mursaleen wa ba'd. Um, so my name is Imam Saeed Persil from the Islamic Center of Irving. I am the outreach coordinator there at the Islamic Center of Irving. So part of my responsibilities involve visiting some of the state facilities and previously federal facilities um, in the Texas area. So I've uh, visited over a half dozen different facilities in the area in the last couple of years um, and had experience interacting with uh, different in populations in each of the different locations, etc. So I've been blessed and I do refer to it as a blessing to have the contact with these individuals and to hear their stories, um, try and respond to their needs and their requests and uh, serve sometimes as a bit of a medium between themselves and the chaplaincy department of whether it's TDCJ or the uh, BOP and things like that, et cetera. <clears throat> as 
Um, other than that, I, I don't want to preempt too much of the conversation right now, but we'll get into the different the different aspects of this, and I'll do my best to um, share from the uh, faith community's perspective how we can respond or maybe things that we should be focused on in our response to these individuals, um, especially as they're coming out of the facilities and back into general population, general society, and how we can support that transition and make them successful in this life, inshallah, and the next. Great. We are very pleased to have uh, you in our panel. And then we would like to also introduce with uh, us an academician, uh, Dr. Wafik Sabir, and uh, would like to get academic point of view from him. So, Dr. W Sabir, if you can briefly introduce yourself uh, to our audience, please. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I I'm actually traveling, <clears throat> and so much strong. Um, but I'll I'll do this. Ms. Wafik Sabir, I am. I have two careers. One, uh, my first career is that of a retired police officer. I uh, served 25 years uh, in the Fort Police Department. Um, the majority of that time was spent uh, working uh, more plain clothes. Some people thought I was undercover, but plain clothes operations, so you never saw me in uniform. I uh, retired from, from that in 2011, so I've been officially retired for uh, 10 years, gone on 11, um, mashallah. And uh, my second career is uh, I'm an educator, uh, associate professor of sociology and criminal justice uh, at Tarrant County College. And I uh, recently received a promotion over the summer uh, to department chair of behavioral sciences, where I oversee sociology, psychology, anthropology, social work, and criminal justice. And so that's just uh, a little bit of, of my um, professional background. Great. Congratulations, Dr. Sabir. So maybe we will Rats, touch, yeah. touch base with you, inshallah, what kind of teaching certificates or career our brothers who would be uh, joining our community can benefit, benefit from community colleges, especially Tarrant County Community College. So let's move along. So Alhamdulillah, when we visit, uh, you know, Dawa, prison Dawa, we meet uh, brothers, you know, who are you know there for 10 years 20 years 15 years one year and sometime when we know that they will be going home in a in a six month in a year or two years anticipated time sometime we find we, we find brothers who are really excited they want to meet their family they are really excited they're going to see their new baby who they didn't see or their parents other times we find brothers who are really nervous Hey, I, I mean, I've been in prison for 20 years. I've been in prison in 40 years. I don't know where are my families. I don't have anybody to go. Uh, I, if, I don't know who is going to give me the first night to stay. And, you know, this kind of pressure, uh, you know, put a tremendous depression uh, while they are in prison. So instead of being excited, they get depressed. So uh, when we were giving uh, da in prison, we tried to find a link. Let's see, you know, where is, uh, you know, his going to get released sometime you know if a person is serving their time in a city uh, they might be getting released in another city so uh, department of justice uh, bureau of prison they they provide them transportation plane ticket or you know whatever way to take them to the city however when they get released you know they they are really depressed so this is uh, the discussion is for our 
let's go for our business community. So as a employer, employment provider, uh, what can we do, uh, Mr. Gafur, uh, to, you know, uh, accept or to provide employment? Maybe we can create some kind of, is there a way, a, a quota or job uh, opportunity so we can take that information to the chaplains of the prisoners and tell them anytime any Muslim prison who is going to be released, these are the conditions they can come to this employment and you know seek uh, you know job from uh, from these or they can come to this program and get trained while you know they're going to be training would be covering some kind of expenses for them. So what can Muslim business owner or employers can provide for brothers like this, Mr. Gafu, please. Uh, Brother Abu, I, myself and every other business included, uh, it, it, it seems like it's an upside down world we're living in. Uh, There's so many job openings everywhere you look. Uh, my God, I, I think uh, I'm not the first one to tell you this. It, it's, all, it's all around us. We're all, all short staffed. We, I'm working with less than half of the crew, you know, that I would be it would be just a couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, it used to be our standards were much higher <laughs> uh, because you had, uh, even though it was a revolving door, people came in, people left, but uh, there were more people coming in, you know, or at least as many people coming in as they were, as they were going. But now, because the government support, you know, government is, is giving them more money to, you know, to sit home than, you know, even the employers are paying them. So the government is, uh, anyways, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't bring that up. But we are severely, severely short-staffed. Uh, for anybody out there, whether you're coming out of prison or uh, there are no shortage of jobs today. I could, I could reassure you of that. Uh, for somebody who wants to work, who wants to, uh, you know, no job shortage. Um, so there isn't very much planning involved right now. Uh, somebody who wants to work, you know, wants to prove themselves. Uh, every every business is, is is struggling to find, you know, more, you know, team players that will do a good job. Yeah, very good. However, uh, the situation we are discussing, these these are not uh, regular brothers we'll see in our community. Yeah. They have yeah. some history and they might face some kind of, you know, challenge to adjust them. They never worked in this kind of, uh, you know, pressure uh, situation. And, uh, you know, sometimes we find, you know, they might have, uh, you know, uh, patience issue. They cannot tolerate, you know, job pressure. Or, and other time they might not, you know, have a home. Uh, they, they Somebody needs to sponsor them when they get released. So we are talking about, you know, variety of uh, individuals who are going to be getting released. You know, those who have families, sponsor, Alhamdulillah, they are good. But we're talking about the niche, you know, there are some, you know, individuals who, who don't have any sponsor. How can we create, uh, you know, as a, from employment, you know, would you be, uh, like sometimes if you have a, an opening for a highly qualified job, I know employer pay a plane ticket for the interview, employer pay, you know, a hotel ticket for them to stay and interview and start. But uh, we are talking about maybe not, you know, not that high level can Candidates, we're talking about minimum, uh, you know, uh, skill sets, individuals, so they will not have, you know, any kind of uh, shelter to stay overnight where, you know, they can stay. Yeah. What kind of, you know, suggestion would you give them? Uh, I could tell you in my own business, I'm not looking for any experience. I'm looking for somebody who's a hard worker, who's going to show up and do what they said, you know, what they're trained to do. Uh, I just need somebody to show up and do a good job and we'll, we'll train them. Uh, so, and, uh, gosh, my businesses are a little bit farther out, a couple of hours from here, but I would hire right away. Uh, and, uh, if you, in, in terms of quotas, I'll be on board to whatever you guys, you know, recommend, we could talk more about it, uh, but I would love to play a role in that. Uh, and I think more, more, any business would, whether it's, uh, you know, Muslim owned or non-Muslim owned, uh, we're all struggling to, to hire more people. Uh, so yeah, a quota, uh, yeah, I, I think that would work. But uh, 
right now it may not even be necessary. Um, and uh, again, like I said, uh, businesses were much pickier several years ago. Uh, I could tell you from my own experience, um, you know, somebody, I, I'm, I was all about second chances, you know, but not third, fourth and fifth chances. It used to be that, uh, uh, you know, we were very forgiven in terms of, uh, hey, you got in trouble, you were in jail, now you're out. Uh, but there were degrees of, you know, what kind of trouble did you get into? Was it for theft or was it just, you know, somebody smoking, you know, a little bit of, you know. Uh, uh, but anyway, those standards seem like because we are so short staffed, those standards have been lowered more and more these days because other, uh, you know, so many jobs to, to you know, uh, that are still unfilled our own standards, <laughs> I would hate to say it have been lowered, you know, uh, but. Uh, Great to know. What about the housing and the transportation? So we're talking about, you know, the individuals who are gonna get off, they will not have housing, they will not have transportation. Do you think the business, uh, you know, owners or employers would be able to accommodate them with housing or, you know, be flexible as far as transportation or give them some kind of support toward their transportation? I mean, I could tell you for myself, I've had people in the past, uh, you know, they weren't in jail, but uh, somebody that I helped with, you know, apartment rental uh, that, you know, I knew that would show up, they were committed, they never called in, they were dependable, uh, reliable, uh, you know, just never any problems out of them. Uh, and uh, I've, uh, I've chipped in quite a bit actually to pay for their uh, accommodation. And uh, we made it a point to find them something that was uh, walking distance from the, you know, from the job. So yes, uh, if I've done it, I'm sure, you know, other people have, would be more inclined to do so as well. Uh, but yes, that, that does go on. Okay, great. So we are very pleased that individuals like you, business entrepreneurs yeah. like you, are yeah. open to help our brothers, you know, in this desperate situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Now we will move to the Islamic communities as far as mosques, other organizations. Uh, what can Islamic organization as a whole can support? I know many of the Islamic organizations providing the materials, education support, and kind of, you know, counseling, advisory support within the prison. But how about when they get out? What kind of uh, support can our Muslim organizations, especially in North Texas can provide to these brothers, uh, uh, Sheikh Parcel, please. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as the support that the Muslim community can offer, I think uh, one of the most important things is to uh, be a resource. Sometimes I think we make the mistake of trying to be all things to all people, and that's inevitably self-defeating many times. Um, rather than trying to do a lot of things poorly, finding niche things that you can do well as a community is perhaps more efficient and more effective. But then having a knowledge base whereby when people come to you with these kind of needs, you have places you can send them, relationships you've nurtured with other groups and organizations, with other even business people, etc., that you can then refer them over to that have maybe some other resources or some other capacities that they can step in and fulfill. But like as an example from the Islamic Center of Irving, somebody that's coming to us would be eligible for uh, financial aid potentially, um, food pantry assistance, um, uninsured medical medical coverage, in terms of the free clinic that we have, things like that, etc. We don't have a formal counseling system or program at ICI, but those sorts of services are available at others. So that's another possibility as well, and because obviously they come with a uh, multiplicity of needs and and things that they're dealing with. Some of it just the process of coming out. You you describe the excitement of some and the the reluctance, the reticence of others. I would uh, I would actually argue that that's really two, uh, two sides of the same coin. That individuals are feeling both things, 
at the same time. I, I think it was you that had forwarded an article about the mental health issues that inmates are, are experiencing as they're being released. And some of it was this, this kind of almost um, schizophrenic uh, feeling about the release. It's, you're glad to be free, quote unquote free, but then you're facing a lot of uncertainties, especially if you don't have a network to support you on the outside. And for many, as you alluded to, that are converting on the inside, what networks they might have had that were that were not destructive previously may not be supportive now because of their Islam. And so that creates a greater burden even on especially the Islamic centers and the institutions like that, because then their uh, their role really in that moment is to step in to say that, you know, you you saw you saw it clear to accept this message, accept this call, you know, that nothing deserves to be worshipped except for Allah. And so it's our responsibility now and as much as we're capable of doing so is to support you in that, is to be able to allow you to grow into your faith, providing you the means but wherewith to do that, uh, at, you know, at a bare minimum, a roof over your head, food, food in your pantry, you know, and clothes on your back, you know, and then if transportation is possible or something of those, those natures, and even work. You know, some of the Islamic centers, like our Islamic centers, being you know being one of the largest in North Texas and and beyond, um, we have opportunities sometimes for work, whether short term or long term, where well, that could be a possible uh, avenue for some individuals. But again, I think the biggest role that the Islamic centers can play is to be a hub for resources to help refer people along that, you know, there may be certain things that we can do very well for an individual situation, but we don't want to try and branch out too widely. So specialize in those areas that you have the greatest gifts and capacity for, and then be a uh, very voracious uh, consumer of information regarding all of the other resources that may be available in the larger community so that where you don't have something that somebody needs, you can then connect them to those people that do. And building those relationships, I mean, and being that I'm in outreach, that's something that I'm, that I'm very accustomed to is the idea that you have to be able to form relationships with individuals. And sometimes you have to be thinking strategically, so to speak, that which relationships do I need to nurture in order to be of service to my constituents, of service to my community, so that you build these bonds and these relationships and you create this uh, give and take between them so that when needs arise that you may not be able to address, that you then can connect your your people to those resources and have developed a relationship where when you refer them, they may even get um a white love treatment if you will you know special treatment or or you know being given a better experience because of the relationship you nurtured with those organizations great great that's very uh you know uh, very good to know that you know this kind of supports are available from our muslim organization islamic organization especially like you have mentioned uh, islamic association of uh, arming or islamic community of arming however one thing that i noticed that you know having the housing housing accommodation because whenever they they get released the first night they need they need a place to you know stay to sleep that was the most challenging you know, whenever we, uh, you know, don't have a facility, uh, you know, we have to pay, you know, motel or hotel or try to see if some house or if brother living single or if they have a roommate or if there are, are Islamic organizations, uh, housing facilities available. Can you touch base, uh, you know, uh, if that is available? So that's a good question, and thank you for drawing out that that particular need. There, there are um, two organizations within the Muslim community that I'm aware of that provide services of this nature. One of them is through uh, ICNA Relief, the Islamic Circle of North America. They have a men's halfway house. Um, I believe it's in the Dallas area. Um, and then there is another group called Huma Faith, um, out of Fort Worth that has a shelter as well in the Fort Worth area that does similar work. Um, the one thing I do know about them, I've not had the chance to visit them myself directly, but um, they're small uh, efforts 
and frequently they're full. So that is that is one of the big challenges. And there, unfortunately, men's shelters are not well supported within the Muslim community. The the need, the necessity of these things to help in those transitions is is not really appreciated. People understand and appreciate the idea of women's shelters a little better. They 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 understand the need, but they don't understand the need of, for men's shelters, especially for halfway houses for men that are coming out of out of the these institutions especially again those ones that don't have networks or the networks they did have are no longer going to be favorable for them or even healthy for them in some instances and so there's an education process that needs to happen in that regard and um trying to encourage though those parts of our community that sometimes become siloed and become um, for lack of a better way of saying it, a little self-absorbed um, into the needs of others, uh, those that are less fortunate, those that are, you know, have circumstances that are difficult or, or challenging, and to make them sensitive to that, make them make them concerned about that, and caring about that, so that they then can see the need in the in the cause of these sorts of institutions and these sorts of services, whether it's offered by the Islamic centers themselves or you go to the satellite groups that are doing the work on behalf of the Muslim community and support them adequately. Because both of them, I know, are uh, uh, hand-to-mouth, so to speak, in terms of their resources and their and their facilities. They, they survive, but barely. Great, great. And uh, we are very excited to know the programs that are offered for our brothers. However, I think uh, we don't want to forget that they are also sisters, uh, you know, they are in prison and we don't know what uh, what kind of statistics available for them, you know, accepting Islam. But I think uh, the general, uh, you know, uh, statistics I have came across is like around five to seven percent of all populations, uh, uh, you know, they are, are females. So uh, I haven't seen any uh, sisters, Muslim sisters, volunteering for prison dawa. I, I, I have seen one or two sisters doing it but uh, uh Sheikh what would you say can you share something about the sisters dawa program in prison and uh, the facilities we're talking about are the same for brothers and sisters um as far as the outreach to the to the women in prison it, i agree it doesn't exist in in a in a large way but what i can say is that i know that there's a lot of interest in it um, from sisters um, and from others, and actually, I know the conversation I've had um, recently with the area Muslim chaplain for uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice in this particular region. Um, he's actively searching for females to visit the prisons, etc. So the need is there. There is interest on both sides of the fence. I think it's been a slow process of connecting people, and of course. The last basically two years have been kind of a wash. You and I both would know we have yet to have seen the inside of the federal prisons in the last two years. We have no idea who's left or what the circumstances are or anything else of our communities that we were serving in the federal prison. So it's it's been challenging to say the least. Yep, great. Yeah, so that's good. So we, we would, uh, you know, encourage our sisters, you know, if they are available to volunteer, you know, uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen and you have to have a, you know, clear background to participate in this kind of program. So we hope, you know, you are, uh, you know, available to serve these unfortunate uh, individuals. Now we'll move to uh, Dr. Sabir, you know, from, you know, academic institute wise, you know, what kind of information he can provide for these uh, brothers and sisters uh, so that they can have, you know, if see, they can have any financial assistance or what kind of degree program or what kind of skill sets they can acquire from uh, like Tarrant County Community College or any other institution in general. Uh, so Dr. Sabine, I know you are in traveling. So if you uh, can hear us, please, uh, you know, provide your suggestion. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to um, make a comment. The um, uh, brother who said that the uh, earlier that society 
it's upside down. I agree with that 110%. Uh, what I have found is when individuals have served their time um, and they are released, if they're not you know, released for a violent or sex offense, um, and even if, if, if so, that society is very unforgi unforgiving and, and that becomes uh, an extreme challenge for not only the individual, for, but for the, the groups and the resources that may be available um, to them because they're not as forgiving. And, and even though we haven't addressed backgrounds and the, the type of offenders, because um, not every offender is the same, even though human needs are all the same, but not every offender is the same. And so being able to tap into the conditions of their release, I think is, is extremely important to identify. Uh, but I'll say this, that I know with a good counselor and a good advocate that typically will need to come from within the uh, system, within the prison system before the person is released is extremely important because I think what you mentioned earlier is that once the person has been released, um, you know, where are they gonna lay their head the first day? Where are they gonna get their first meal? Uh, where are they gonna get um, a supply of clothes? Uh, where's their transportation? Uh, some people don't even have a driver's license, uh, let alone, you know, the ability to drive a vehicle. So you have all of these, these things that have to be identified and I find that those that have had the advocates within the system prior to release tend to do a little bit better. I give an example. I had a student one year who was on um, supervision. She had an ankle monitor. <clears throat> and um, it was obvious to me that she had this ankle monitor. And for the brothers on the call, we know what that looks like on someone's ankle. It's but so many uh, layers of, of socks that you can put over that, um, actually that makes it even more obvious. But <clears throat> I believe the class that I was teaching was uh, called criminology or it may have been sociology, but either way, um, she sat in the front, um, she didn't interact with anyone else in the class and she shared with me that she had, um, she had served time on, for drug drug charges. And essentially what it was, she was holding possession of drugs for uh, a boyfriend of hers who didn't serve time. So she ended up serving serving time. Um, what I thought was, was really interesting about her case was she's sitting in my class and yes, she's been released. She's on, on parole for drugs. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how did she manage to do this? Uh, because most people who have drug offenses do not qualify for financial aid. They may be able to apply for scholarships, you know, private scholarships, but financial aid is typically not awarded to someone who has um, a, a background, drugs or violent crimes, right? And and so throughout the semester, she, what she shared with me was, was, was so um, interesting. And, and I only hope that this is something that can or is available. I'm, but I, I, I'm thinking that it's really all about who's advocating for them. So, so this is what she shared. She said, yes, I was um, sentenced to 10 years. Her children were taken away. She's away from her family. Um, and she said, but the advocate in the prison said, but when you get out, you have to continue your education. And long story short, she knew that she wouldn't qualify for financial aid. She could not afford college. Well, there must have been a loophole because this advocate found a way for her not only to be in college, but for her to qualify for financial aid. Um, and therefore, there she was in my class. Well, halfway through the semester, um, she was standing in the hallways, you know, before class. 
and she never stood in the hallway. She was always in the classroom, like one of the first ones. And she was standing in the hallway and I remember looking at her and she had this, this, this smile on her face. And immediately I looked at her ankles and the monitor was gone. Because she was um, diligent in the pursuit of education that she demonstrated to not only her advocate, but I imagine it must have been a parole board or some, or, or some committee that she demonstrated to them her pursuit of excellence in higher education. And before the semester was over with, they took the ankle monitor off of her. I know that there are resources are available to people such as this in this situation. I think when we look at, as the Sheikh had mentioned earlier, um, organizations, Islamic organizations being resources, I think this is where we have to be probably more versed in what the policies are um, the rules and the regulations, because it's 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 fine to give someone a job and say, hey, I'm going to hire you, but I have no way of of getting to that job. I have no way of of I have no other resources available. I think it really would be uh, worth the time of the organizations that perhaps that we have mentioned um, that they're able to tap into that. Because I know if this um, young lady was able to attend college after having felony drug offenses and receive financial aid, I know it's available. And I think at the end of the day that the resources that we oftentimes um, are looking at, we don't really dig deep enough to find out where those loop, loopholes um, may be. But I, I wanted to share that story. It's, it's a very powerful story. I, I know she went on to do well and, and to graduate, but you know, it started from someone being able to tap into those, those external resources in the community for her to be successful um, in, the, in, the, in the free world. And the last thing that I'll mention is in Tarrant County, as a brother mentioned, human faith, um, it's, human faith is like a house. And so that house cannot accommodate dozens of women that are coming out. So we know it has to be, um, that is one of the bigger challenges, but you do have a commissioner in Tarrant County uh, Commissioner Roy C. Brooks. And at that county level, there are going to be um, um, additional funding, additional accommodations, additional resources that perhaps it may be worth um, um, looking deeper into if we're, we're talking about trying to assist uh, um, Muslims um, coming out into the free world. I think that there are things that are available um, for us, but but perhaps we may have to collaborate or um, at least connect and come to the table and at least know what's what's available. Great, that's a very uh, successful story, and uh, I, I believe it will uh, you know encourage uh, many of the brothers sisters out there that you know to continue pursue uh, you know all the good intention, especially acquiring education, you know established jobs. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sabir, to share that story. I think it will be very helpful. So I know we if, are all on the if I could, real quick. I'd like to share something that uh, that kind of dovetails with uh, what uh, Dr. Sobir just mentioned. Um, so speaking of, to the educational component that he was referring to amongst the things that I know are available, because uh, I'm in a conversation right now in Irving with Dallas College. Um, they have free services that they can provide on site at, in this case, our center for things like ESL classes, level one certifications and things like that. So as long as they don't require, you know, dedicated equipment like welding and things like that, if it's more like coding or things like that, they, they're, my hope is that they will be doing it at our center and providing that service to the larger community. And hopefully some of the recently released citizens from the institutions that we serve, et cetera, as well as higher level uh, programs and everything else that are at 
um, drastically reduced costs. Again, some of them able to be done at us at one of the centers or things like that, etc. So absolutely, to echo what Dr. Sabir is saying, definitely there are resources out there. And what we need to do is to, again, I referenced it, to, to come out of our silos, to, to, to break out of our bubbles and to start to really engage and find out what is available out there. There's other communities that have dealt with these problems you know, you know, for longer, more successfully, et cetera. Learn the best practices that are out there and apply them to, you know, to, to our needy and to our, our communities, et cetera, and be able to serve them the way that they need to be served. Great. Any, any final comment, uh, Mr. Gafoor? Well, uh, I'll, uh, what Sheikh said earlier uh, about success in both dunya and akhira in this life, well, is the next. Uh, well, we are all, whether the panel sitting here or, you know, whoever will be watching this, well, we are all struggling in our own ways, one way or another. Uh, you know, it's uh, let's all learn to struggle well uh to make the right choices for for dunya this life well as the next you know we're, we're all after that success you know let's let's learn to struggle well so the almighty god forgives us i mean i mean yeah thank you i mean i mean so we, we would like to mention that you know some some community members might have you know those kind of feelings that you know oh he's getting she's getting out of prison you know all those uh you know sometimes negative mentality but we need to remember that you know prophets even prophet uh used to yeah, yeah you know he was in prison you know so it's not like you know sometimes we fall into the you know wrong place wrong time and Absolutely. other times you know disadvantage situations so we do not know what kind of test we will face in our life so let's not judge people whoever in whatever condition we try to help them and especially if we you and i or anybody else uh, have an opportunity to help anyway at least you know do you know whatever you could uh, uh, you know, if you cannot do anything, at least pray for them. At least pray in your sujood. May so and so be safe. May so and so be, uh, you know, happy in his or her life. So that way, we we are Muslims. We are blessing to the community, and we should be blessing here in the United States in every place. You know, wherever we go. Any final thought, Doctor Sabir? I, 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 um, I just want to thank you for allowing me to um, to share my comments and, and thoughts and, and being a part of this. I, I really didn't think that I was going to be able to hang on as long as I as I have. I had some company come in and plans change. And next thing you know, you're sent out to go get things from the store. So um, <laughs> but I've been able to hang, been able to hang on. Uh, but um, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, it's been able to hang on, uh, but but no, this this is one of those conversations that um, I think more and more people uh, need to hear. It's it, you know because when you talk about criminal justice, it's it's, it's a three layer cake, and the, the layer that I was on for for so many years, twenty five years, was the law enforcement piece, um, but here. Um, as a as an educator, and I have students who are looking to enter criminal justice, I have to find a balance because not everyone is is really equipped to be in law enforcement, uh, but some will will probably do very well in the in the courts, and some will do very well in corrections, um, and all of the the support that goes along with that. So I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear um, that that you took the lead on this conversation, um, doctor. So thank you very much. Indeed. And all the Bless. brothers that have uh, on, on today's conversation. Okay, may Allah bless all of us. May Allah keep us safe, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.